Hi everyone, thank you very much for joining. Um, please join me, welcome Dr. Uh, Ernest Coco today for giving the presentation. Dr. Ernest is a professor in the School of Mathematical Science at RIT. He earned his PhD in statistics at the University of Glasgow from UK. And he was a postdoc, uh, postdoctoral fellow at the Statistical and Applied Mathematical Science Institute. Please happy uh, join me. Welcome, Dr. Ernest, um, for giving the presentation for today at the seminar. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Gina. Thank you. Thank you. Honestly, I have very little expectation for this seminar, right? You know, have you ever heard the expression? Have you ever heard the expression playing with house money? I know you've heard that. I'm not a gambler because I always recommend my students against gambling because I know a very famous theorem known as the gambler's ruin that many of you teach in your classes. So I don't recommend anyone to be a gambler. But I know the expression house money. You know why I deem this to be house money? I just flew home from Africa. I sat there by dint of my greatest blessing of being an extended faculty of CIS. I do receive all the emails from CIS. And an email came that said the person who was supposed to give this talk, for some reason, was not able to do it. And then the email said, if anyone would please jump up to give this talk, that would be greatly appreciated. I said, oh. You know why? Since I give a talk at CIS, I'm gonna try my luck. And then I send an email, and then two minutes later, I heard you got it. You got it. Yeah. So I'm actually playing with house money. I mean, really, I'm playing with house money in the sense that um, I wasn't supposed to give this talk. And if you like it, then I'm very happy. I'm blessed. If you don't like it, then I'm not gonna experience the sting of it too bad <laughs> because I was not scheduled to give it. Can you imagine? That is a wonderful place to start from. <laughs> that I am as relaxed as you can get. Almost zen like. Right? And today, it gives me tremendous joy to tell you about a paradigm that I love with every ounce of my being. <laughs> the Bayesian paradigm. Now, maybe some of you have heard of the word conditional probability. I hope so. If you're in this room and you've not heard of conditional probability, please leave now. <laughs> the door is open. There's one door there, there's one door there, and there's a door here. If you don't know the word conditional probability, please depart. Just leave. Thank you. If you know that word and you decide to stay, we might have some fun. Because I'm going to tell you also, I love uncertainty. I'm going to put it out there immediately now so that it's clear. Because when I talk, it comes out of me. I am a very religious man. I'm not saying this to convert anyone to my religion. But it's just the way I function. So what informs what I do is my religion. From the morning till I go back to sleep. Probably that's why I love Thomas Bates so much. Because he's actually Reverend Thomas Bates. The next time you go to London... Go to the cemetery and say thank you to him. Because this paradigm is rich beyond measure. Now, you will not be able to ascertain the richness of this paradigm by the end of one hour lecture. If you've not been exposed to the Bayesian paradigm, don't hope that this one hour will allow you to appreciate the breadth and depth of what Bayes gave us. Here's my hope. By the time I finish this lecture, I want you to be intrigued by the mistakes that you have. I want you to be intrigued. Why do I love uncertainty? Because the way I see life is that we're not certain about anything. When I left Africa, I was a young, young guy, and I went to England for one year, and then I went to Scotland, and I met this great man who just passed away last year, my advisor, Mike Davidson, and he treated me like his own son. Can you imagine I had my PhD meeting with him every Friday, and he would sit me right there, he would left me, he would sit me right there, and the love that I felt from this man was incredible. It was palpably powerful. And all the talks I give throughout this year until 2024 is over, I will be dedicating it to the great one. He's a beautiful man. I know Mike is in heaven. I know that. Because his heart was beautiful. Among the great statisticians, he was one of the greatest, but you would not know it. He was small. 
And I've learned from him how to drape my own shoes. He's given the natural. Out of pure, unadulterated life. Period. There's no other way to be a PhD fighter than to be a fighter. If you're, direct, if you're directing people and you don't make them feel that sense that you are transmitting to them something that transcends your own understanding, I'm not sure what kind of PhD you have. And I learned that from my kids. So please, as the hour wears on, keep in mind this beautiful thing, my academic father. Thank you. And I don't want to thank this center for allowing me to give this talk. I realized one thing. I learned this phrase from Albert Einstein. I give myself credit for nothing. And I know this is an outrageous statement, but it's true. I give myself credit for exactly nothing. Why do I say that at 56 years of age? Because I see the most beautiful things of my life. I know the thing I try too hard to get. The thing I try too hard to get sometimes I got. But the joy was short lived. But the majority of things surprised me like this very presentation. I'm sitting peacefully in Kigali. I had no clue that on this Wednesday, January 31st, I'll be giving a presentation in my beautiful, my favorite room on this campus, by the way. In fact, when I'm booking rooms for my seminar for everything, I always say, can you give me CAR 1125, please? I just love the structure of this room. I've given so many presentations on this room without any member of CIS being involved. No, no because like that, my little stat conferences and all that, they always tend to happen in this room. So I was surprised by this presentation. And I'm grateful to all of you for being here. I'm grateful to you for listening to me say this stuff. I'm going to do my best to give you the little I know about the vision data. These are things that are collage left, right, and center from a boatload of people, starting with my advisor, my teacher intern, and people who really taught me to know things about the concept of paradigm. You know, it, there's very big temptation when we do statistical analysis, or any analysis for that matter, to be so tunnel vision into the nitty gritty of what's there. But I learned one thing is that when you don't zoom out to see the paradigm, what is it that's driving this whole thing? Like the laws of physics, the laws of the Newton and stuff like that. Now, I'm not saying that everybody should be an epistemologist like me, but I realized one thing. The only reason why I get to enjoy statistics as much as I do is because I've been blessed with great mentors that have allowed me to have that very healthy ability to just depart from it a little bit and see it from the big picture. So that's what you're going to get from my presentation. I'm trying to present you the concept of the Bayesian way of thinking. And by the time the presentation ends, I will be trying to communicate with you the fact that the Bayesian paradigm is the super paradigm of thinking about anything where uncertainty is involved. And we all know that when you deal with data of any kind, there will be uncertainty. If you have data and you have a fragment of the population, which we call with great affection and sample, certainly, if you do it correctly, you should have impersonal chance. And we need a good language for navigating in personal chance. And that's the language that I'm trying to show you in my cascade of uncertainty, why I came to believe that the Bayesian paradigm has something to offer you. Now, I'm not saying this in a philosophical sense, but even in a practical sense, the Bayesian paradigm has a lot to offer. And the reason why I believe that, now, like I say, is because as I navigate my own life, I realize that the only thing that actually even makes this life interesting is uncertainty. Really, people feel uncomfortable with anything uncertain, but if there's no uncertainty, if there's no concept of entropy or surprise, then life can be very quickly very boring. So as scientists that we all are, isn't it fitting that we should have a language that we believe is complete enough? to handle uncertainty. So in the cascade, I'm going to try to make a point that thinking Bayesianly, if you afford me the term, thinking Bayesianly is going to provide you with that you know, incredible uh, 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 mechanism. Now, by the way, before I even go into the technicality of this presentation, I will be very, very pleased if you can interrupt me anytime. Really, I like more like an interactive presentation rather than, rather than a one-way presentation. I'm a preacher. So I can do one way. It's very easy for me because I'm a preacher. I can preach. I can preach for 10 hours. I just need some water. <laughs> so, but, but I don't want this to be preaching. I want this to be an, an, an exchange. So if you have, if anything is uncomfortable, like my notation is weird, 
please stop me and I'll be glad. I'm not, I'm not, you can even say that I'm an idiot. That's right too. I've known that for 56 years. So, so that's good. So here's the thing. Here's what I'm trying to say. I'm going to give you three different problems that I think are interesting. These are some of the success stories of the Bayesian paradigm. This is one of the biggest success story of the Bayesian paradigm. It's a sad story of an airliner from Air France that disappears and then people try hard to find it until this little firm in, uh, I think it was in Washington DC or somewhere where people were using the Bayesian paradigm. They started using the Bayesian paradigm. Basically they were using aspects of particle filters and, and little stuff and, and they ended up finding the airliner in the coast of Brazil. And that was the use of the, the correct use of uncertainty is what afforded them the opportunity to do that. So this is a this is like almost a little bit of a, a, a gospel kind of way to tell you. I'm not just telling you the Bayesian paradigm is good. In fact, I'm telling you that there were problems that no other paradigm could solve that could only be solved when people got the Bayesian paradigm. So that's the point I'm trying to make by giving you this very groom example of the uh, Air France airliner that disappeared in the coast of Brazil. And then, uh, and certainly, and the starting point of this is what Deming says, right, about data. That in a sense, we are trying to make sense of the universe by phenomenology, right? We look at data. Even uh, people that believe that, you know, there's a separation between deduction and induction, they make me laugh because how do you end up with a deductive principle? Is by observation, but how did you end up observing? Because there was a principle inside of you. You cannot really disentangle them. At every point, philosophically, when you're analyzing things, there's a sense that these two paradigms are kind of related. But then it gives us a sense that for us humans who are mortal, the starting point is always data. The starting point is data. Now, maybe maybe Chomsky will disagree because he believes that there is some kind of universal grammar in us. But I think that what I know is that we start with data. Okay, we start with data. And then, so this problem is an interesting problem. There's another problem that is probably closer to you guys because I think in imaging science, sometimes people deal with uh, problems of, of, of denoising. And then um, there's so many of these problems of problems of recommended systems, of problems of statistical machine learning, like classification with some very funky decision boundaries. Now, these five problems that I just presented, or six problems that I just presented to you, all have in common the suscitation of the construction of a mathematical model. So in all these problems, the experimenter is trying to construct a model in order to make a decision. That's it. Like if you're trying to do the noisy, you're constructing a model so that when you put in an image, then the image that comes out of it is a cleaner image than what enters. So, but what the, the common denominator of all of them is a model. But what I'm saying is that whether you call it mathematical model or statistical model, all those models, because they're based on random samples, rather at least samples that you make as random as you can make them, they have uncertainty. They have uncertainty. So, and that uncertainty is better managed by using language. So, so by the way, this presentation is actually offshoot of a paper that I wrote in which I find something very funny because the initial idea of this paper was, the idea was, to base or not to base, that's no longer the question. That was the title of the initial paper. And I was very proud of myself because I thought, man, I find a nice little play on Shakespeare phrase to be or not to be. I was very proud of thinking, man, nobody ever thought, how come nobody ever thought of giving such a title to a paper? Shock, shock. I found the email that many people have given a similar title to have answer. <laughs> oh man, my pride was so broken down. I was so pitifully sad that I'm not the first one to use that phrase. Like, the initial preprint of this paper, the white paper, which was to base on not to base, which in fact is on archive, in which I'm basically I'm basically realizing the Bayesian paradigm is everywhere. That's why I call on the ubiquity of the Bayesian paradigm. Because I see it everywhere. In fact, even in places I never suspected it to come out. Even people who are doing things they don't realize that is Bayesian. In some sense, it's Bayesian. As a matter of fact, most of my undergraduate students, their understanding of a confidence interval is not frequency. When they talk about a confidence interval, they are mistakenly calling a frequency interval a Bayesian interval without knowing it. And that's, in fact, I noticed that for so many years as a young assistant professor that I thought. Is the Bayesian paradigm natural in human beings? 
No, no, that's a stretch. Okay. So I'm not trying to I'm not trying to take this too far, but that's when I came up with the idea of could it be that Bayesian paradigm is everywhere? And in this paper, you see, I'm trying to show that almost every single thing I've done in my life in statistics, even the things that were called frequentist, were actually had some Bayesian flavor to them. Now, I use that word so much that you may be wondering. So for those of you who have not done anything in Bayesian, you may be wondering, what is Bayesian? Well, if you want a very simple, like layperson's account of the Bayesian paradigm, you know who you should ask? Don't ask mathematicians or statisticians. Ask religious people. They are extremely proud of Bayes and Newton because they're proud of anyone who was at once religious and also mathematical. mathematical. And this book is famous. This book, and this woman has given so many presentations on this concept of the theory that would not die. If you don't know the story of the Bayesian paradigm, if you don't know the story of P of A given B, is P of A intersection B divided by P of B? Let me tell you with two minutes what it is. Bayes was a preacher, Reverend Thomas Bayes, his name, in London. And what happened? Bayes loved mathematics. But Bayes actually designed this theory and died without publishing. Okay? His friend, and God bless him, instead of appropriating the theory, he went and gave it to the Royal Society to be read. And that's how we have the people together. I wonder if all the blessings around the Bayesian paradigm come from the fact that there was so much truth and goodwill all over the chains of the Bayesian paradigm. So these people are extremely proud of Bayes, but also proud of his friend who actually brought the article to be read at the Royal Society. So in a sense, that's that's what it is. So this is called the theory that would not die because the man who actually authored it actually died without publishing it. And his friend, checking in his document, realized, man, this stuff is good. And he brought it to the Royal Society in London. They read it, and the rest is history. Now, of course, most of what we know at the Bayesian Pan was developed by, by Laplace. Laplace is so smart. He did so many things, and he he formalized some of the things that were a little clunky in Bayes' initial foray. So the form that we know the most today are due to the great Laplace. All right? So anyway, so this is the cascade I want to treat you to. I call them the different levels of stochastic. You know this. The fact that I'm using different words should not make you think that this comes from me. These are things that are inherent in any data analysis venture. What happens, there is the so-called deterministic view. I call it stochastic of order zero. What is it? Somebody trying to do regression without the Gaussian node. Now, sometimes I actually wonder, when people do that, do they wake up the next day? Or do they die in bed? Can you do yeah, because how can you see a cloud of points and tell me that you are not going to endow that, that perturbation with something, right? It's very strange. Now, I don't know, honestly. I've never really been exposed to many things around random samples that are treated without the language of a circle. I know people do that, but I have a hard time explaining away what really is happening because there is uncertainty. How do you quantify it? in a deterministic sense. So that's what we call the concept of stochastic of order zero. That is the variation is of course there, but the person prefers to think of it as something determined. But the stochastic of order one is what most of you have done all your life. When you construct the confidence interval, basically you're doing something called the Fisherian statistics, also known as the frequency statistics, because it's a very weird kind of statistics where you say, you know what, this thing is uncertain, but I'm going to imagine that there's so many replicas of this, because that's the idea of the Fisherian. The idea of a confidence interval is, I don't know if this confidence interval contains mu, but I know that if I repeat this exercise many times, 95% of these confidence intervals will contain mu, and 5% of them won't. Now, to me as a Bayesian, because I'm a professor and confess Bayesian, that is extremely senseless. It doesn't even make sense. Because I only ever had one confidence interval. Why are you telling me that if I repeat it, I'm not going to repeat it many times. Tell me everything about this confidence interval. Don't tell me about saying some hypothetical confidence interval. But then the third level is what I call the Bayesian view. What is the Bayesian view? In fact, let me tell you something. The idea of a Bayesian view doesn't even have to be something that you have to believe. The idea of the Bayesian view is that if you are to be a statistician, or if you are to be an empiricist, 
Anything that you don't know should be treated with the same language. To me, I call it the consistency of the basic thought. It's not fragmented. Let me explain. When I say y equal theta x plus theta zero plus epsilon, when I write that statement, that statement contains a lot of stuff. I am saying as a Bayesian that if there's a, anything in that statement that is unknown, I have to use the same language of probability. That's what I call stochastic of origin. It is not something to believe. It's just a matter of being honest, of being complete in my way of thinking. Okay, so that's what it is. So, like I say, I never know the actual population mean of starting salaries of CIS PhD graduates. I don't know that number. That number is not no way bold. You can't know that number. Therefore, that number has uncertainty attached to it. The best way for me to deal with this is to endow that number with a probability function. That's base. If you remain, if you retain nothing from my presentation, retain that for a Bayesian, whatever you don't know has to be handled with the language of the things that you don't know, which is not good. So that's the basic topic. And that is something very powerful, right? The mechanics of it gets very complicated, right? So, so, and that's what I just said, right? So, so you have to handle everything that you don't know using the same language. That's what it is, okay? And the language that I'm talking about is the language of probability. Okay, so in other words, as, as an imaging science person, I want you to take this, if you take no picture from this class, from this presentation, this is the picture. That's the picture, because this picture, everyone in this room should know this picture. What? You start with data. I don't care if your data is, 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 is some hyperspectral images. I don't care what it is. It doesn't matter to me. It's data. It's data that's coming from some mother. That mother is called joint distribution. That's the mother. That's the mother that's generating a bunch of observations. And you try to make sense of those observations by constructing a model. If your model is parametric in nature, you have a guy called theta. You can call it what you want. You can call it Annie or John. Well, statisticians call it theta. You have a parameter theta that drives you, like in regression, regression coefficient. They drive your model. Okay? Like in support vector machine, you have something that's written like that. And then, but then you have those parameters that you want to estimate. People's, many people spend tons of PhD estimating parameters. But then you have also on top of the parameter the complexity of the model. Like if you have a regression, how many of the predictive variables do you need? You need to have how, how complex that model is, right? So you have that model complexity and you have the model size complexity. And finally, you have the universe. And this is where things get really nice. This universe, we never know it. We don't know that universe. In fact, the whole point of science is searching for the origin of things. So in the Bayesian paradigm, we will be able to endow everything here with some language. Probability. If I don't know model complexity, maybe I can use a Poisson distribution to drive my model complexity or gamma, something that handles complexity. Instead of just saying, well, the complexity is unknown, but it's somewhere. No, no, no. If it's unknown, what kind of probability distribution drives it? That's the point. Okay, so that's the point here. So this is the graphic of my slide number 27 that captures everything I'm trying to say. It's all about a cascade of uncertainty and the language for handling that cascade of uncertainty, right? So that's the Bayesian paradigm. So this one here is coming from sampling. So when you sample, when you have distribution for sampling the data, this handles this one. This one comes from what the primary estimation, maximum likelihood, uh, minimum description length, Bayesian estimation, all those different paradigms are helping you handle this part. And this one here is using all kinds of statistical method to handle this model complexity like Poisson distribution, gamma distribution, all kinds of stuff that you use to handle this. All right? All right, so oh, here, perfect. yes, please. Yeah. So back on 27 and then you- Please, John, go, go, 27, yeah, tell me. <laughs> uh, the language that you show, mm -hmm. level three and four, the mathematics was the same to me. Level three. level three and level four. Oh yeah, level three and level four. In level three, I'm trying to, in level four, I'm trying to find gamma. In level three, I'm trying to find the size of gamma. Let me explain clearly. I'm gonna explain that to you in regression, right? Let me explain to you because this is the framework, right? In the number one, you have data. Hmm? You have a scatter plot, blah, blah, blah. 
And the number two, you think you have a parametric model. Maybe polynomial regression. If you have polynomial regression, at this level, you're trying to find what we call which monomials are in the model. Are you going to use the monomial number four and seven? So you try to find the atoms. In this level, you find how many atoms. Right, so also maybe the copy and paste, that's actually right, because the copy and paste is not reflected. But here, here you're trying to find the size of gamma, because gamma is a vector that points to the atoms of your model. Like in polynomial regression, I have polynomial of a degree at most P. So the notation is missing something. It's, no, no, say it, it was John, it was copy, copy and paste. The guy did not make it so this one should have been different. Okay. Yes. This one is finding the atoms, and this one is finding how many atoms. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's what critical for us to understand. No, absolutely no. That John, I appreciate because like that's what I'm saying. It's a type of that I didn't even realize until you mentioned it. Because I'm just so jazzed up talking about it, I forgot that, that there's something missing there. See, John is falling. <laughs> Yeah, he's all here. So yeah, this is this is the model complex understanding. This is what I'm trying to tell. How many atoms? Which atoms? Because you can have monomial one and seven. You can have monomial one and eight, but they're still size two. You still have a size two model, but the atoms that enter the models are different. So you have to be mindful of how big is my model and which atoms, which basis functions are taking part in my Fourier. And then what are the parameters? And finally, go say it's a cascade, you're going up. But the point I'm making, John, is that at every single level, it's so, I, I, I don't know what it is. When you drink the Kool-Aid of Bayes, it becomes very hard for you not to think of it in terms of probability. Because the concept of saying why frequencies say, well, it's a fixed number, you just don't know it. It's not very weird. If it's, if it's unknown, then the only way I can handle it is by using the language of fields that we don't know which is probability. What distribution does that unknown follow? Is it an average one? You don't know, is that closer to standard? Is it closer to mean? Where is it? So that's the idea of the basic mechanics. That's, that's what I'm, I find it to be very flexible, basically. So, and again, I realize that even what I'm saying, Bayes can help you solve very interesting problems. But of course, I'm going to be, at the end, I'm going to be telling you some caveat of Bayes, right? The price to pay is that Bayes is computationally very, very demanding. Like everything else you pay, I mean, you, you get what you pay for. I mean, you 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 want all that kind of sophistication, then you end up having to pay for it. So, I, is it making sense though? So I'm not, I'm not, I don't want to talk at you. I want to invite you to this. We do modeling. All of us in this room, we do modeling. When we do modeling, we have a casket on things we don't know. We have data, we want to find this, and we're trying to learn constants. And all that the Bayesian paradigm does, frankly speaking, is augment your frequent is thinking with this ability to seek different ways of explaining the unknowns with a more complete language. So that's that's what it is. And so what Bayes started off, in fact, I have a I have an invitation to give a series of lectures in India in January. I did it in 2013 at the anniversary of Bayes. And then the anniversary of Bayes, they invited me back again to give that same series of lectures. But th those are more like hands-on things. For the undergrad, for the graduate students, and many people write many things about Bayes, and because, you know, there were times when the Bayesian paradigm was actually almost controversial. So, so you know, it, it was controversial in the sense that, as you look at the formula that I'm going to show you in a minute, so I just want to double check my time. So, you're going to see that the Bayesian paradigm has a big problem if, when you think about it as a paradigm, which means uh, we are thinking of framework for thinking about problems. It's very rich, very beautiful. Is it all work? Can we do this all work? Yes, we Yes. And the first question that comes is, why do I get this distribution? And that's when people start hating the Bayesian paradigm because it's it. And in fact, what they hated about the Bayesian paradigm is actually what I love about it. People did not like the concept of a subjective prior. I actually love the concept of a subjective prior. The reason why I love the concept of subjective prior because immediately, in one single phrase, I can be a scientist and an artist at the same time. I can provide something that is sui generis to a process that is objective. So I think that, to me, that I find that very, very, very exciting. So now, the rest of this talk is going to have a lot of complicated formula, but sorry. The, but the idea is not to bamboozle you with formula. I think the first one everybody knows. This first one that you see in your stat 251 class, or the equivalent of whatever you took that class in the past. And 
In fact, if you start to get into philosophical underpinnings of this, it's extremely powerful because this law of total probability, which was later formalized by people like Omrov and stuff like that, is extremely powerful because you can see it even in a simple contingency table. But until Bayes, people didn't have that. They didn't have that kind of reasoning around the language of Kant, because the, the article is on the, the treatise on language, uh, you know, treatise on probability of Kant's events or whatever it is. So, so what I'm saying here is that this formula itself starts by telling a, a lot of stuff, and the application of this simple formula alone are manifold. You know, whether you're constructing learning machines or whether you're studying COVID or malaria or whatever, whether you're studying anything in diagnosis, this is an incredibly powerful formula. And one of the best ways to summarize this to those of you who probably have not been exposed to the base background is this. When you see that formula, the concept of a prior of likelihood and evidence and a posterior. So basically you have four moving parts. And the four moving parts appear to me, in most cases, to be very germane to our normal life, the way that we live our life. Right? I know this is a very simple way to make people feel comfortable with the Bayesian paradigm. Right? But in a sense, the Bayesian paradigm almost normalizes the fact that it is difficult for a human being not to have a prejudice. The only bad thing with a prejudice is when it's a bad prejudice. In fact, human beings cannot help it but have a prejudice. What does that mean? It means that in the presence of any event, there's a cascade of preconceived notions about that event that you have. Now, if those cascades are very strong, they will dominate the conclusion you have about the event in your head. So the event in your head is called the likelihood of your conclusion. So that conclusion is your parameter theta. I have a parameter theta about this regression. I think it's not far from nine. But I'm seeing a lot of observations that are not. And I'm gonna update my nine. Of that problem. So that's what the Bayesian paradigm is basically saying. It's basically saying that you are deluding yourself in thinking that the event in front of you is the only thing that you're using to draw conclusions. Because you as an entity, you traverse life, there are certainly baggage that you carry. So when you are doing modeling, for instance, when you're doing modeling and you're an engineer or you are you know, an image scientist or whatever, over the years, you accumulate knowledge about processes. And each time you are dealing with a new process, whether you want it or not, that experience will come to bear. And the Bayesian is saying, it's more honest and more complete to incorporate that knowledge into your thinking. Is that making sense? So in the concept, for, so the Bayesian paradigm pretends to be more complete than the non-Bayesian paradigm because it reflects the natural way that human beings navigate events and phenomena. So PB, when I say P of A given B, is P of B times P of A divided by P of A. I'm basically saying that what it is is that I'm updating my knowledge. I'm really updating my knowledge, but there's a prior about B that I have. Before the likelihood of B, which is P of A given B, is the likelihood of B. You know, it's like a bee is driving me, and then because of the way bee is driving me, there are events that are happening around me. That's what it is, the most likely thing. So that's where this formula comes from, right? From a purely philosophical perspective, it's telling us that the way we navigate life is by actually updating our knowledge. Now, for those of you who've done a little bit of uh, hypothesis testing, the most beautiful way to do hypothesis testing, believe it or not, is not what you've done all your life. It's the Bayesian way. Why? Because I told you the way my students interpret calculus. That's the same way they interpret p-values. They think that the p-value is a probability of h and x. It is not. No. The probability of h not can only be calculated by Bayesian. Because if you're not a Bayesian, you don't have a distribution around h not. You do not. The only distribution you have is around your test statistics. So if you want to be able to speak about hypothesis testing the way all of you speak about it, yeah. in your baptism is going to be very good. Yeah. Make sure that there are a lot of drinks there. Mm -hmm. and All right. So, so basically, that's what it is. Basically, I'm telling you in a very covert way that you have thought basically without even realizing. 
For those of you who are not careful, you've been thinking that by calculating by your cattle probabilization, you are not. You are not. You are not. Because let me tell you something. When you do frequencies, confidence interval or hypothesis testing, this is what it goes like. It goes something like this. If the disease was there, what is the probability of this symptom? That's what you've been doing for all your life, basically. The business said that is a case of sorrow. You have the symptoms. Use the symptoms. So the business say, given that we know the symptoms, what? What it means, I'm reducing the space for all statisticians is always about dimension reduction summary, dimension reduction. The other thinking is now you have two things you don't know. You're doing the probability of the symptom and you're doing the probability of the event. It's just hard. So in other words, what I'm saying is that when you think Bayesianly, it, it, it may be that people in their mind are Bayesian without knowing it. So if you, if you download the slides of my talk, I would like for you to comment to me offline about how you feel about this slide. I'm telling you, this is what you've been thinking all your life when you did hypothesis testing. And if you don't pay attention, this is the only way you think. This way is correct, provided that you did it basically, provided that you endow your null hypothesis with a probability, which is in this case not that hard. Okay, so. so if, if your hypothesis is either true or false, how would you have a problem? If it's a balloon, it's a balloon, right? But usually the problem, the, the, the no hypothesis not so far, that is, the no hypothesis was that theta is greater than some bigger zero. And theta is continuous, you can have a gamma distribution, normal distribution or not. So you can endow that statement, theta greater than or equal to theta zero, with a probability in your thinking of theta as a random variable. If theta is a random variable, then you can endow with a probability. But if you're thinking like the frequency that theta is fixed, there's no probability. It's either zero or it's not zero. So it's just very, it's like a, what do you call that, a point mass distribution. Point mass distribution, I'm not being, uh, I'm not being fascinated by, maybe you are, but I'm not. <laughs> so, so, but you see the point here, right? So it gives you that kind of, honestly, guys, please do me a favor. If you learn nothing from my lecture, I wanted to get away from this lecture that the Bayesian paradigm is an option, is something for you to consider to have a more flexible and probably a richer analysis. And my office is not far. In the sense that if you want more of this, give me a knock at 2517, building 14. That's an advertising, right? So now here is what made me happiest. In fact, this is the origin I was telling you earlier why I wrote this paper. Because when I was with Mike and we started doing a lot of machine learning in Glasgow, and I realized that almost every aspect of theoretical machine learning was using aspect of Bayesian. Because in machine learning, what you're basically doing in generalization, what you're doing with neural networks, you're trying to find the machine that generalizes that. What does that mean? The machine that the error is close to something called the smallest possible error. Hello? You know how you get the smallest possible error theoretically? With the Bayes formula. That's why they call it the Bayes learning machine. That machine is calculated using the posterior probability of class membership in classification. This is the gold standard in statistical learning theory. Every single learning machine that's been built is built to try and emulate F star. And F star is obtained using Bayes. It's a Bayesian quantity. In regression, in regression, you always see under the square error law the expected value of y given x. You know where it came from? That expected value of y given x is the conditional expectation. You get it using what? The Bayes formula. It's Bayes. It's Bayesian. <coughs> That's why I say Bayes is everywhere. I mean, I kept seeing it everywhere. In fact, even in places I did not suspect that the standard, the gold standard. So when you do regression, you cannot, if you can get this, well, which in practice, you can, you, you can get this, you do, but usually you approximate this using a linear model, the portal, but you approximate it. But the real goal standard is expected value of y given x. 
which is the Bayesian constant. All right? So, so in other words, we've seen Bayesian everywhere. Even this one came from another, another reverend, the reverend, uh, uh, um, what do you call that? The guy, he, these guys were, you wonder, you thought they were up in the synagogue, in the what? In the, well, monastery, praying, but they were doing mathematics. These guys are bizarre. Yeah, I usually think these guys were just praying, but they were just doing mathematics. So, in, in, in other words, in fact, you see this picture, which is the central picture of the classical machine learning, a bias variance trade off, that all machines are basically compromised between a machine that fits too well and a machine that fits too little. And okay, it, it has a Bayesian. How does it have a Bayesian interpretation? Because of this formula. If you ever took my Bayesian class, statistics 789, you will see we actually prove clearly that the solution, the Bayesian solution, what is it? The Bayesian solution actually shows that you cannot do without Bayes in your life, even if you wanted to. Right? You may not even call it Bayes, but Bayes is everywhere. What is this? This is what we call the estimation of the probability of success, something that we do in elections, something that we do in quality control, something that we do in disease, in disease control, like when we, when we try to monitor COVID or other things, we use the same fellow, the probability of success, well, in that case, success is not a good thing, probability of illness, but uh, the probability of the event, and it turns out that in fact, when you do non-Bayesian things, you're doing what we call a poor man's version of the Bayesian thing. In other words, the maximum likelihood estimator is actually a, what we call a degenerate. It's a degenerate thing. So in other words, in indirect way, you're doing base. Okay? So this is right there in your basic regression. When you're doing regression and you do ridge regression, lasso regression, ridge regression is base regression. Ridge is base when you use the L2 as your prior. If you use the Gaussian prior for your parameter theta, then you have basic. In fact, in the original paper, Paul recognizes it. He recognizes it. He says, oh, who teaches basic? Then you can read the paper. So he, he's from the state of New York, so he should be proud. If you read the paper of the original uh, read regression paper, which is actually, it's a, actually a monumental discovery in, in, in statistics which is not talked about as much as generalized linear model. And even the generalized linear model as well is also another thing where the Bayesian paradigm is appearing. So it's appearing everywhere. So now, this is the gold standard in statistical machine learning. What's it called? It's called regularized learning. Structural risk minimization. You take the empirical risk of your classifier and you tag on what we call a penalty for stabilizing, for solving the Hadamard Hughes problem. Hello? It has a Bayesian formulation. In fact, this object here is the log. Is this is the logarithm? This is the logarithm of a prior. This is the logarithm of a prior distribution. Now you may say, oh, of course, why do you have to teach the Bayesian formulation if it works? Here's the thing: the Bayesian formulation provides you with a mechanism for uncertainty quantification, reducing it to the log posterior does not give you that out. It's the beginning. It's a good beginning of something of great quality. But what I'm saying is that the Bayesian paradigm is going to enrich your life by providing you with mechanism. Now, when you start doing a little bit of machine learning in your thesis, you will notice something. You notice one of the machines, that simple machine that came to us from Stanford called GLMNet, Generalized Linear Model, or GAMNet, Generalized Additive Model Net. We've had two machines that were, you know, they were designed by guys at Stanford who were not the clear Bayesian. But even to realize that by augmenting or rather taking back the logarithm and going back to the distribution, you actually have a better interpretation of this machine. And I know something now because I've been traveling a lot lately, and many people are requesting machines to provide a solid so called uncertainty quantification. So you construct your models, people are happy, you deploy them, people are using them, but nowadays more and more people request. That you provide a beautiful, very clear mechanism for a certain quantification. I'm here to tell you, without the language of the Bayesian paradigm, it's very difficult to do that. Now, I'm hoping if somebody can come, come up with another paradigm that does it, fine. But I'm telling you, with the Bayesian paradigm, it's straightforward. It's very natural because you look at every unknown as a random variable, and then you endow them with this distribution that allow you to do that. Okay.
We can, how many minutes I have? Two seconds? 15, okay, I'm not in trouble. I'm not yet in trouble, okay. So yeah, in, in fact, this, in the 12th century, when this guy coined the term, um, you know, the parsimony, nobody, I, I didn't even realize until I saw the Ridge regression that what William of Ockham is telling us is actually very Bayesian. But even though he was born like, you know, 600 years before Bayes, but in a sense, what William of Ockham is recommending in his epistemological treatise about modeling is that that bias variance trade-off is actually a Bayesian thing. In fact, all Bayesian estimators have that property. All Bayesian estimators have the property that, uh, that uh, William of Ockham was promoting, which basically in a practical sense is very simple, right? If you fit in stupidly, your model will overfit and then it will predict poorly. That's what it is in a sense. But if you endow your parameter space or your function space with a prior knowledge on the complexity of the model, you'll be able to actually calm the model down back to the place where the optimality is in sample and out of sample. So that's what the prior gives you. So anyway, and of course, yeah, this is what I'm saying here, the Harama well postness principle that everybody in this room knows because most of the problems that many of you have also, like the problems I work on, are usually problems that are ill-posed in one sense or another. But the Bayesian paradigm allows you a mechanism for solving this Harama ill postness problem. Okay, last but not least, I just want to mention some few things here, but this has to do with like, you know, you've heard of recommend the system, image denoising, image completion, and all that stuff. Luckily, in the Bayesian paradigm, in fact, these formulas may look a little bit scary, but honestly, these mechanisms are pretty straightforward. If you've done anything resembling non-negative matrix factorization, then you know these expressions are very common. But it turns out that what made non-negative matrix factorization even stronger is when people started regularizing it. But for me, I look at that from a Bayesian perspective because I still want to be able not just to see these regularized forms, but to actually deal with it as a probability. So the language of probability, like you saw in my slide number seven, is a lingua franca of all this. Okay, so, so any more questions? So the, the last thing, so th this is a very simple example. This is a simple example of image. Demo. Now, this is deceptively simple to see here, but, but when you start doing these things, you see the language of it is quite, quite simple. That you have an image and you want to have a version of it that is cleaner. And it's so straightforward to see how you can do that in Bayesian paradigm by just endowing your origin with some prior. Like people use parts model. They use all kinds of simple models in image denoting in order to be able to denote the image with some kind of prior knowledge they have about the image. And they incorporate that prior knowledge in this prior probability. And, then, and you can work on it in this very simple concept. Now, okay, most very good Bayesian don't like this form of it because this is called the maximum of posteriori. But it's still Bayesian, okay, because you're still using the prior but a true, the so-called true Bayesian, they don't like maximum posteriori enough. Because the reason why you hear this, if you hear a guy say, you tell him, yeah, I listened to Bayesian lecture, and right now I'm working on maximum posteriori, some of them will tell you, and, and you say, Bayesian, right, there's a prior. But then the answer they'll give you, they'll tell you, a Bayesian is not impressed by a point estimate. What is a point estimate? Because when you do this, you're basically saying that the mode of your posterior is your point of focus. No, to the Bayesian, what's interesting is not the mode of the posterior, it's the entire of the posterior distribution. Because you can play with it. The idea is you want to construct the posterior distribution and be able to play with it. Do all kinds of things like quantile. So if, if you just limit yourself to the mode of it, they say, but that's very poor. What about the mean? What about the mean? Yeah, that's the difference between a mathematician and an engineer. The engineer wants a solution. That's true. Maybe that'd be right. So maybe they, and you, John, you make a very strong point, right? The majority of the people who are very attached to the maximum posteriori are engineers, actually. You make a very compelling point. You tell them, no, concentrate on the entire posterior. Say, I don't care. This gives, I have something in my head. Thank you for your prior. Goodbye. Until they're asked about the uncertainty. And then they're stuck, right? Because they don't have the posterior anymore. See? John, you should have been giving this lecture instead of me. <laughs> John is my friend, so he's just trying to make me feel good. <laughs> so, of course, 
of course, I, I think that honestly, one of one of the things I, I I want to communicate this to you honestly with such unadulterated joy, partly because I actually love the Big Mac Cheese. To be honest with you, so I love playing with it because it gives me the extra outlet of no. I, I don't like dead things, like things like oh, it's finished. Sometimes when things finish, I'm like, oh, what's the next step? So that's why I love my posterior because I can play with it. I can look at the one box. I can look at the box product. I can play with it. So that, that, that's what it is. In fact, even in the um, in this thing here, one of the things that I did when I was postdoc over North Carolina was the, I was I intersected with a bunch of guys that were oh totally in love with particle filters. You know, they took the you know common filters and then you know put it on steroids. So it was really fascinating what they could do with it. And in fact, this wreckage thing is that in fact is solved using some measure of particle filter. I will not disabuse you with this extra stuff. The last thing I'm going to tell you is that many of you probably hear all the time about deep learning and you use it a lot and use it a lot. And one of the things that I think was probably the last minute when I was writing this paper, I said, I'm definitely writing this paper, is when I realized this fragment of my master's thesis in which I was working for, I was working on Gaussian processes. You know, you work on these Gaussian process classifiers. And I didn't even realize really how powerful a tool I was manipulating. This is a Bayesian object, right? And I realized that now, as you probably heard or read, one of the bottlenecks of deep learning is that people don't have a great grasp on the theory underlying why sometimes deep learning works so well. And guess where that agreement is coming from? From the Bayesian theory. The beam of hope is coming from the so-called Bayesian Gaussian process. Because Brad Benil from the University of Toronto, in his doctoral thesis, he found this connection between neural networks and Gaussian processes. One single hidden layer neural network with infinite number of nodes, what they call now wide neural networks, hold the key to the explanation of some of the incredible performance of deep learning. All thanks to the ability to endow the thing with a prior and manipulate the interior with a prior. So okay, the idea was these Gaussian processes, so it was called Bayesian neural network. That was the title of the doctoral dissertation, is Bayesian uh, uh, Bayesian neural network. And that's where he found that beautiful theorem. In fact, the doctoral dissertation was actually published as a book by Springer. So it's very interesting. So this was one of the things that made me say, oh, it has a promise of helping us understand deep neural network. And in that sense, from this thing called Gaussian process, I mean, I don't know if you've ever been around Gaussian process, but Gaussian process is something that act like magical tool. They're very impressive. So you can do regression with Gaussian. These are the so-called Gaussian priors from function spaces. And you do this by just using kernels as you would in, the, in, in support vector machines. And from there, you're able to reconstruct function with absolutely deadly accuracy. But it turns out that these Gaussian processes, which are also, some of the formulations of neural network with one single hidden layer with infinite number of nodes in that layer trying to hold the key to uh, the explanation of why some of the deep learning machines are so very powerful. Anyway, here's the, here's the final word I'm going to give you. What I want you to get from this lecture really is the sense that you do modeling, I do modeling. A lot of times the idea that Bayesian tries to convince people is we're not just trying to get you to use an expert tool and come to save your life. Basically, the short for Bayesian is when you model, you have to use physics to do it. Don't go into the world. What does that mean? If you have plenty of knowledge about your problem, please, as a Bayesian fan, provide it to the world. Thank you. Uh, one question, not from John, from somebody else. Any questions from anyone? Yeah. Thinking of this is maybe all throughout your talk is uh, you could perhaps use Bayesian to describe the personality that owned the beam of the pulse. And owned the beam. Oh, yeah. And so my question to you is if what is the what what's the mistake that that person makes? Is it their prior, their estimate of the prior is wrong, or their estimate of marginal probability is wrong, or their estimate of the uh, of the condition problem? I think that about, you know, I mean, it's honestly, I mean, I could say that with certainty is uh, is the vulnerability. 
is that what it is is that the fire is too strong in terms of just embracing everything without stretching it. Because the idea is that you have lightning, right? You are in presence of phenomena. You have phenomenology, like like data, right? You're observing it, you have a histogram, and you're asking yourself, what distribution is it? Is it gamma? Is it log normal, right? So you, because those distributions are similar in some sense, but in very subtle ways, they can be very different. Like at the scale of them, they're different. So my understanding of this, which many sociologists, by the way, have used the data set. In fact, one of the books when I first talked to David Cole was by a guy from Florida, very large book, where he did a very, he does a very beautiful job in that. Some of the data are very categorical data. So here's the point I'm trying to make. You can model this by just collecting information, but my initial point is, is that the fire for this person is too strong because he's not taking into account what is happening around him. So if you think that this guy is not striking this well again, and he doesn't really, he does not feel this. So the fire is too strong in favor of anger. That's my rough perspective in how people can be easily swayed by things. They're not combining the likelihood of the fire. It's very vast though. I want you guys to check this out. And my office is not far. If anything caught your fancy and you don't even know, so okay, Ernest, I got nothing out of your talk. Can you give me a short, like 10 seconds? I, I can entertain that too. So if you want to talk to me about the Bayesian paradigm, don't, I will assume that you know nothing. So you're safe. So you can tell me, I got zero, your talk was a disaster. Mm -hmm. I'll say, okay, I'm sorry, I did not intend for it to be that way, but how can I help solve that problem? Let's make it less of a disaster. So it's just, it's just honestly, honestly, without too much other things, I think that as a scientist, we should use other tools to ask things that when you, if you have a problem where the Bayesian paradigm could be useful, I want you to remember this talk as one way to think about it. There's so many examples where people have used the Bayesian paradigm to talk to me. So I guess, yes. Are there any areas where a Bayesian paradigm you think would be helpful to have solutions? Say that again? Are there any areas or anything where you think the Bayesian paradigm would be helpful to have solutions? In any areas? Yeah, in fact, when you have, that's a, very, that's a beautiful question, right? It's a good way of thinking, but I get anything where, when you try to work with, in fact, the answer may be almost like weird. Let me tell you the weird answer. Sometimes it's not physically clear what you have. See, because the, the idea, I'm not trying to say Bayesian paradigm is foolproof. It's a good way of thinking, right? I don't, it's not something you have to believe. You just have to see this, this paradigm is a key. It gives me a framework for thinking, but sometimes coming up with a good fire is hard. Second thing, when the problems are very large, we don't have enough computers for solving Bayesian problems because unfortunately, the promise of solving many problems comes at the price of extremely heavy computation. Because in the Bayesian paradigm, there's that thing called normalizing function. For mm -hmm. even simple problems, that normalizing function is like integral in high dimensions. In fact, because of the Bayesian paradigm, many different fields of statistics were born. You know, before, before the rise of Bayesian paradigm, Markovsky and Monte Carlo was nowhere to be. Nobody cared about it. People did Monte Carlo. People did Monte Carlo since the 1920s, the 1950s, with their hands. But MCMC, Markov Chain Monte Carlo, was only born because the posterior distribution, that most exalted thing, is not easy to obtain in practice. For a very small size problem, the posterior becomes very complex because it becomes a very complex integral in function space or in extremely high dimension space. In that case, you can't even track the Bayesian paradigm. You try to be so fast you can see. That, okay, the Bayesian paradigm gives me a framework for thinking about it, but like John was saying, engineering, baby, give me an answer. Don't tell me about your science. Can you give me a number? Give me a number. The engineer can give me something. There are many problems in which the Bayesian can give you a number. It's pretty too complicated. In fact, before the 1990s, famous paper in the DASA, a paper by, uh, by Gerson and Smith that made Bayesian computable. Many people mocked the Bayesian, not because it was not a good theory, but because it was a theory that you could not use because of the computational bottleneck. I don't know if they answer your question. The first the limitation, there are many problems for which finding a good fire is hard. It's very difficult. Well, what, what, is, what is the initial thought about this problem? You don't have it. It would be good if you had it, but you don't have it. And even after you find it, 
to their cars that they could see. Because, but he's getting he's advancing a lot. I mean, just many sharp, smart people decided to go to the Indian paradigm after 1990 because it starts to work. So many brilliant minds are working on it. Like you've heard of relational base leading. That was one of the heydays of the data tech, something called relational, because now big large public com computers, even public modeling, public modeling where you do on text documents were born from the data technology because uh, uh, David Bly and Michael Jordan they find a way to do the Bayesian perhaps a lot corpus of, of stuff. Thank you so much. That I love when he's in my class. He's, he's, no, no, honestly, and I'm not trying to put him on the spot. He's one of the best students I ever had. I'm not trying to embarrass you in public, but because he carries himself so beautifully. I love when he comes to my house sometimes because he, he wants to learn. So thank you. <laughs> thank you. You bless my heart. <laughs> thank you. Any more questions before? Yes, my heart. Uh, so um, we talked about the fire and how hard it could be sometimes. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah, so for high dimensional data, are there any tools that people can use? Oh, yeah, in fact, they, beautiful. They are now companion, they are like um, well known solutions to different types of problems, like uh, you know, family of solutions that people like, like for image noising. And some of the problems, there's so many problems where people have solutions like. If you have anything like that that you want to know more about, I'm more than willing to point you to some direction where for some high dimensional problem in some family of problem, people have come up with ways to help them. And, and the reason why they wanted that so bad is because they could do a certain quantification. You know, in the context of computer experiment and stuff like that, many things have come up with ways to solve some family of problems, not all. But there's still quite a number of problems where finding really reasonable fire is is not as easy. So in a, in a sense, some of like this thing is like kids in you, right? This is a framework that provides you with what we call a complete way of thinking around problems. But sometimes you don't even have the actual, the actual raw materials to find the right Now I'm totally open to anyone who wants the discussion offline. Like I say, we're building content on there. Just shoot me an email, and I'll be more than happy to entertain discussion about you know some of your research that involves the Bayesian paradigm. Okay. By the way, I want to also thank the graduate student, the first year student that uh, they shot with my uh, presentation this noon time. I had a great time with you guys. I want to thank you for having me. And uh, thank Emmett, really, for introducing me. And uh, thank Dima. I mean, I, I never knew I was going to give a presentation on the 31st, but I'm glad that I was the first person who offered to give it. And then just to see my friends here, you see Tony. You know, this, this is my African brother. He, he takes me to Africa all the time. So <laughs> this, uh, my and, and I'm so happy to be here. I'm just, I'm just, I was telling people last thing before before we part ways. I, you know, there's one thing that I realize as I get older, is it, you know, like I was telling the first year student this new time, is that maybe each one of us actually does have a crack at doing something we genuinely love, and maybe we should as family, as friends, and you know, help each other to identify those things. Because once you find something that you really care about. You become a blessing to yourself and to everyone around you. I feel very blessed that I'm, first of all, I'm, I'm extended family of CIS, so always, I'm very grateful, I'm very proud of it. And the opportunity to give this talk, I want to be, I want you to know that it's really lost on me, that I'm extremely grateful beyond what words can capture to be able to share with you this passion that I have for this material and just thank you for sitting in my presentation. And I hope it doesn't waste of your time. I'm really, really grateful. Thank you.